Okay. A bit right here. I'm going to start out and skip all the protocols with the with the normal club procedure. I'm going to start out with Charlie. So give Charlie a hand. This is Charlie uh, Glutz, W4T. Gene Bowman. <laughs> uh, all right, it's all yours, Charlie. Go ahead, Gene. Gene was going to share a slide. All right, well, this is Gene Bowman, WB4MSG. Yeah, and I've just, we put a slideshow together because uh, we're going to put this on the website after the, the meeting here and have it where anyone go, can go on there and look at it. And at the end of the slideshow, the last few slides, I've had people ask me about loops and uh, the, the loops we used at field day. And uh, so what I've done is create a sheet on there that has loops on it and all the dimensions that we use for loops at field day. Also got a sheet that has some inverted V's and the sizes for those. Uh, and also uh, for some dipoles, uh, different stuff. So anyway, it's a bunch of different antenna dimensions and it's a pretty good reference. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the show tonight is going to be on which is the best antenna. And uh, Charlie, uh, if you want to go ahead and start your thing, I'll just show these next three slides with it as you go. Go ahead. I'll, I'll pick it up when we get through the okay. show. Right Before right you right. do that, let's give credit to Jim here for bringing the barbecue. And everybody give Jim a hand for bringing the barbecue. Thank you. At any rate, the three things that may determine which is the best antenna to use, which bands and modes that you're going to operate. Uh, the reason there is, is uh, you know, if you're on the low bands especially, uh, you may want to operate just sideband or just CW. And particular antennas may only cover that segment of the band, so you may have to have multiple antennas up to do both. Uh, or choose an antenna that will cover the whole band. Your operating interest could be the other thing that would determine what would be the best for you, and uh, also the location and size of the QTH. Um, Charlie's going to go over this in more detail here of, of the bands, uh, particularly low bands in a group, and possibly 6.2 and 440 as to which is the better antenna. Um, operating interest would include like nets, uh, service disaster areas. And, and all those different things there, contests and what awards you wanted to chase if you had a particular part of the world you was trying to uh, contact, you may want to put a certain antenna up, especially if it was a wire antenna that would just favor that direction. Um, and your uh, location is a, is a really important part, whether you're restricted to an apartment, a city lot, if you got a lot of land, or if you're going to go mobile or portable. And I've just got some little uh, pictures here just to I know we've got a lot of new hands in here that may not be familiar with a lot of the stuff, so that was one reason we threw, or I threw some of this stuff in here. Um, if you're an apartment, I have used this sort of arrangement when I traveled a lot with Western Electric, and I was able to work guys back here running foam patches from Hawaii and uh, call back home from over in Wales, uh, north of England there, so, you know, but you can do a lot from just a small uh, whip or uh, a dot hole stuck up in the corner. Uh, if you're in an apartment, uh, some people use loops like this, and uh, uh, I have put those up and uh, actually worked here quite a few times on them, and uh, they, they work pretty well. Uh, uh, this looks a little weird, but uh, I tell you what, I've worked 80 meters inside of a house when I was traveling with a slinky antenna like this, and it uh, didn't take much room. And you basically just, uh, you can couple the ends together with like a, a safety pin or something, and pull out enough turns and you can get about any frequency in a short distance with this. Um, if you don't have room to put something up uh, full size, you can always bend the ends down. And just, uh, there's a lot of discussion as to how long you make one versus the other and uh, that's something you just have to experiment with. Uh, if you've got a restricted area or a, you know, a small area, you can put up a dipole with multiple legs and cover different bands with it. Um, this is a friend of mine, that's the antenna that's here tonight. Um, it's a quad, and the main reason I'm showing it, he's got about every band covered on there except for 80 meters and uh, 40. Well, let's see, I think he had 40 on there also. And this is on one tower, and he's barely got enough room in his yard where this is to let it down. So it doesn't take much space, but it's a beautiful job of a quad installation. 
this is a, a guy that's got one of the biggest contest stations up north, believe it or not, and his backyard is just like a city lot. And everything's crammed there, and what you can't see in between this is a lot of dye holes and inverted bees. So, you know, you can do a lot in a, in a really small area. Uh, I guess this would be my dream station if I ever had enough money for it. Uh, this is a station in Finland. And uh, this is his premier antenna, and I just wanted to show you this. It's kind of the extreme of antennas. This is a 160-meter beam, and this is an 80-meter beam over top of it. To give you an idea, this is what it looks like. And he, he put some linearly lo loaded pins on here so he didn't have to make it as long as it would have to be. But each one of these elements is 190 feet long, and it's 350 feet in the air. Each one of the elements weighed 3,800 pounds. And they estimated the lifespan of this thing would be five years before they'd have trouble. And it stayed up a year and came down. Uh, it had an automatic wind detection system on it, so it would automatically turn itself for the least wind load. And they think that's why it failed. That system quit working and it came down. But to give you the idea of the size of an element, uh, there's the center of one of the elements. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty huge. And that's the rotor system that turned it. Um, so that would be the extreme of an antenna. What you get out of that, though, uh, on 160, Charlie and I have worked a lot of 160 over the years, and we both run QRP on there in the contest. And I don't know if everybody knows it, but I guess Charlie's probably got the most awards on 160 for QRP of anybody in the, in the U.S. So, you know, you don't have to, and he's on the city lot, and uh, it's not uncommon to, uh, to work several countries on the weekend with uh, QRP on there with just the loop that he's come up with. So that gives you an idea. Now what this guy can do with this is, of course, he can take five watts and uh, probably work twice as many stations as we could with our loops. But other than that, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of money that come comes down in a year. So, um, Charlie's going to cover verticals and just as a quick uh, thing, we've got a, a vertical here just pulled up in a tree with the weight to hold the tension on it. So it's pretty simple to put one of those up about anywhere. Uh, if you put a post up, you can put the vertical wire up beside the post, and if it's not tall enough, you can always bend the end over to some degree to make it fit. This is what most people will see a lot of these maybe at the ham fest, and if they're not familiar with it, it's a tri-band vertical. And it works uh, just like the tri-band beams. And uh, what you have is traps in here that essentially stop the frequency from going any further. So on 10 meters, it uses this length of pipe and this traps it out here. Uh, this one then would trap it on 15, which would allow the signal to go up to here. And on 20, it would go all the way through to the end and use the full weight. So just to give you an idea, you can throw one of these up in your backyard and get all three bands with one antenna. Um, and, you know, you, you probably would be better to have a few radials under, and Charlie's going to show all that later here. Uh, a simple quarter wave antenna with a quarter wave length vertical and some radials under is, uh, is just a simple ground plane, and that's what your vertical pulled up the tree would be. Um, I like the folded dipole, or folded vertical here, the monopole, in one respect that it bleeds all the static off, and so it's a very good antenna for lightning protection, where the other one doesn't have a way of doing that. Uh, so this idea here is what Charlie used for his invention for the 160 loop that we that me and him are using. And uh, I've got all the dimensions and stuff for this in a little handout. I've got some handouts here that you can take uh, that has this until they run out. I believe we'll have enough for everyone. Uh, but anyway, this is a 160 loop. If you didn't use this and you put a vertical up for 160, it'd have to be 130 foot tall, roughly. So you're able to put this up. My, the top of mine, I've had it anywhere from 45 feet to probably 60 feet. And I can tell very little difference in the, in the results that I get with it. So you put it up in a very, you know, very low compared to 130 feet. And it's basically feed the center of the coax to one side, come over down into the radial system with the other. And it really works super well. Uh, to give you an idea of some two meter antennas, this is what Carol makes uh, 
here in the club, and it's a two meter 440 uh, combination uh, antenna that works really good for the repeaters and stuff. Uh, the dipoles that we're going to talk about is just simple dipoles that the center of the coax goes to one leg, the ground goes to the other. Um, you can make them out of any kind of plastic, the insulators to, for the center, and what you would have is a coax connector here, and this would be where a, a tie wrap would go just to hold the string off of your, uh, of your connection to your uh, connector, and you would have your uh, loop wires or your dipole wires coming through these holes and connecting to there, and there's a way to hold the tension off of that to, uh, to keep from having problems with it in the wind. And that's another view of that. Uh, that's a commercial made one. And that's basically what it looks like up in the air fed with some ladder line. Uh, simply pull them up in a tree and they work. Uh, no problems there. Loops we're going to talk about also. And this is just about as basic as you can get. A delta loop that you would feed at the bottom. And it takes two supports. Now for field day, I turned it upside down, fed it at the bottom, and we only needed one wire up or one rope up over a tree to pull them up, and it made it real fast for us. Now, Jerry uh, Miner came up with an idea, and I think we're going to put it on all the loops, just to tie a rope from here to this point to hold the tension. And uh, so if you were to put these up, that's a good way to do it to, to keep it symmetrical. And then uh, we're going to cover a sky loop here, um, and Charlie will go over that. Uh, that's basically it. The rest of these things, there's your bubble installation. <laughs> uh, and we're going to cover stuff about coaxes here in a little bit. Just as a sideline, I was doing some research for this and I ran across this. Someone found these at Tractor Supply and they're little four inch tubes. You just drill your holes in the end and run your wires through it and you've got you some window iron. So it's a pretty simple way to make your uh, window line. And there's a picture of one of them installed like that with those little pieces. Uh, other information I have in here, just so you know, shows some stuff about antenna gain. It shows power capability of different coaxes, how much loss they have, which we'll we're going to go back and talk about that with Charlie here in a little bit. And at the very end, then, I have uh, dimensions for inverted V's, how high the top was and the bottom when I modeled them and one for each band. Also, this is the loops I used at field day and all the dimensions for those. And that's the wide band 80 meter antenna that we had um, and how it goes up. And then these are some uh, uh, just loop antenna dimensions for putting up a loop. So that's basically what I have on the slides here. So I'll turn it over to Charlie and uh, let him take off on uh, his side of it. Appreciate you. see this. If you can, you might want to move up because I'm going to develop some ideas with it. Well, if you can, once I get through it, perhaps you might want to. Now, Gene gave you probably dozens, maybe hundreds of different antennas in the slideshow. And just as there are probably several hundred types of antennas, there are several hundred textbooks, books, pamphlets, websites that you can get all the information you need about dimensions and how to put them up. I brought two. This is Wire Classics from ARL. This is an antenna handbook from ARL also, but there are literally dozens of them that give you the dimensions. And we're going to pass out, or at least have on the website, isn't that right, Gene? Well, I'm going to pass some out too. Okay. Anyway, so you can build something if you see what we go through that you like. Now, all those books will tell you the dimensions, tell you how to put them up, but it won't tell you which one's best. What I want to do is run through some of the things you can think about to determine which one of these antennas, everything Gene showed, is a variation of a vertical, a dipole, or a balloon. So I want to run through each one of these antennas and I'll tell you the pluses and minuses, pros, cons, where they excel and where they're total flops. You can decide based on what you want to do, which one you want to use. Now, I can't help but wonder how many in here 
have had your license for less than a year, a year or less. Give me a show of hands. It looks like we've got enough to where this is worthwhile. Um, when you decide which antenna you want to put up, there are basically three things you want to keep in mind. What band do you want to operate? And I've listed these up here for those of you that can see it. 160 through 10, that's HF. 6 and 2, VHF. And 70 centimeter UHF. I didn't even list 220. I really don't think we're going to keep that band. I think we'll eventually go the way of 11 meters. Those of you that remember 11 meters. And of course, there's two new ones coming in. 600 meters here when we get the privileges there. And also one down about 135 kc. Now, don't limit yourself when you think about which band you want to work. Don't limit yourself to what you have the privileges to work now. Look at it. Don't paint yourself into a corner. You may be able to work just some of these now, but if you keep progressing, you'll be able to work all of them. So the next thing you want to decide, after you decide what band you want, what type of operation do you want? The first thing is, do you want to just get a just Get on there and talk to anybody that's unlucky enough to come along that will talk to you. <laughs> or as one of our comrades says, blast the air with <laughs> And And most of you know what I'm talking about. Anyway, if that's what you want to do, you can do it on any band. But believe it or not, there's the best antenna for it, depending on where you want to talk and what you want to do. And we'll run through that. Second thing is, do you want to go after some awards? In my era of time, and I'm as old as dirt, when a person got their license, the very first thing they wanted to do was WAS, worked on the states. It's an award that's offered by the ARL for contacting 50 states. And it used to be a real chore. But in this day and time, you can work 50 states on the weekend. Gene, where's Gene? Yeah. Okay. How many states have you worked WAS on, on 160 during the contest, haven't you? Yeah, I, on sideband and yeah, CW she in one weekend with five watts. Five watts. It's not a real big chore anymore. Right. Well, that's pretty good. Uh, and that's on 160. And Alaska and Hawaii are not real loud on 160 with five watts. The next thing you may want to go after is DXCC. That's 100 countries. It used to be a chore too. But if you can find the right contest, and there are dozens of them during the year, you can get your DXCC in one weekend, easily. And you don't have to change the cars to do it anymore. The last award, that I, and I think that probably the hardest to get, the one that means supposed to be, is a WAZ, and that's uh, sponsored by CQ Magazine. It's worked on zones. The world is divided into 40 zones, and if you can make contact with all 40 zones, uh, you get an award for that. Now, you'd think that would be easier than DXCC, and you'd be wrong. There are a couple of zones where there's just not that much activity. The one, the last, stumbling block for me was on 23. And they have three countries there. I can't remember the first. Nepal and Mongolia are the, the other two. And they're just not hot beds of activity that they're there. Then, uh, of course, if you, you set your sight on awards, you can get those. And one of the things that Gene and I enjoy a great deal are contests. How many of you have worked field day? I mentioned just about everybody. Well, most contests are just about the same type thing. The, the rules vary slightly. Uh, some use states as multipliers, some use countries as multipliers. But they're usually a last a weekend. And you can operate your own. It's a wonderful way to pick up your country count or state count. The 160 contest is, is, a, is a snap for 160. I mean for WAS. And believe it or not, 
You can work a lot of DX on 160. I had, on one of our contests, I had uh, 26 or 28 European countries with less than five watts. So the, the, the real secret here is the antenna. If you have to put your money somewhere, put it on your antenna. And the nice thing about contests, it gives you the opportunity to check your equipment, to check your skills. And see, so, you know, uh, you can make a lot of contacts in a short period of time and find out where the high spots and low parts are. Gene and I both have World High School RP scores for 160 contests. And there's one thread that runs through our score. Gene always has more stateside contacts than I do, and I always have more DX contacts. And I believe it's because my antenna is a little higher than his and has a little lower angle. I believe that's what it is. Maybe wrong, it's just a it's just a thought. But both of us have really enjoyed doing this. Wonderful way to check your equipment and see that it's working. Okay, so let's go from that into the antennas. How they work, the pluses and minuses of each one. And let me give you just a quick overview. The vertical is basically an index antenna. It has a low angle of radiation. It's not good for gabbing on the well, uh, let's say the eastern half of the United States. If you want to work at some 40 meters, this is a loser. You can do it, but you just won't have much of a signal. This, on the other hand, at the right height, is a barn burner. It can be a, uh, 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 a real plus. Given the right height, it's not as good as that, a low band, local work. For working low band DX, this is a loser. Anything from 40, 80, and 160, forget it. You might get the Caribbean, but that's just about the size of it. And I'm going to go through and show you why that is. The vertical, one of the big pluses that it has is, if you don't have the space to put that up, then one of the, the, the real advantages there is, if you, if, you, if you lot will not allow you to put this up, if you can't go out, go up. And I probably shouldn't bring this up. I'm not encouraging anybody to do something dishonest. But if you live on a residential area with a lot size, just about the size of a postage stamp, and you have a zoning requirement that won't allow you to have an antenna, I can show you how to hide that sucker. <laughs> and you can work every band with it. I'll show you how that's done. Charlie, that's a uh, valve you down in there with the vertical, the square? The square. Okay, I'll be that to that just a minute. Actually, this is the dog house. Those of you that aren't familiar, this is a matching network. And the reason it's blank is because I haven't decided what to put in the jet. Good question. It's called in commercial practice, you see an AM broadcast station. You'll generally see a little house beside the tower. And that's affectionately called the dog house. It houses the matching network that you need there. And you'll see what that is in a few minutes. Develop that. Anybody have any questions about this part? One more. Is that third antenna wrong? Is it also known as a... It looks like one. You no, know, this is what's called a, a, a sky loop. I've got two loops here. This one is perpendicular to the ground. It can either be with the point down or the point up. This one is parallel to the ground, and a rhombic is usually fed on the end here as opposed to this point. And if uh, if it were a rhombic, you'd feed it here and you'd have a terminating resistor there. Incidentally, I once had a rhombic for 10 meters. My dad didn't is, is care it for it. Is it similar in operation? Or does it work the same? Do what? Similar in operation, does it work the same? No, not at all, not at all. A rhombic base is this way. I mean, it transmits that way. A rhombic would be the feed line here, 
usually 600 ohm open wire feed line, you'd have a resistor here. As a matter of interest, because the resistor has to dissipate half the power going in. The AT and T, I had a friend, we had to go up to Washington for a meeting and we got out early and he said, I want to show you something. We went over and looked at a trans uh, oceanic radio link that AT and T had. What they had was this. I'm digressing, but it's interesting. What they had was a rhombo with about eight or nine dB gain, probably tw closer to 12. A rhombo, you feed it here, you've got to dissipate half the power there using a carbon resistor. What they did was take, with the phasing correctly, let's say they put a key in here, here, they'd have to get rid of 500 watts here. They feed it into another rhombo, They have to dissipate 250 watts here. They carry it down. You can see rhombics as far as the eye can see. The gain on that thing was unbelievable. They never had an outage. A little digression. This is a sky loop. A rhombic feeds that way. This one. You can feed it anywhere. The pattern is straight up. And you can get the gain on the order of a four element beam going straight up. And as you can guess, that's what you want if you want to blast airways on the eastern half of the United States. It is a terrific low band antenna for working with it. It is not worth a damn for DX. Well, let me change that. They can be fed on any band, and on the higher bands, it will it has a lot. Matter of fact, if you look at the pattern of one of the guys has one of these, this guy lived on 160. It's 135 feet on each corner, each leg. He uses on 10 meters, and the pattern on it looks like a porcupine. Their wheels going everywhere. Okay. Now, before I get into how each one of these things operate. There's one thing I want to talk about that's common to each one. Everybody want to guess what it is? Feed line. And for the purpose of demonstration, explanation, whatever, I want to use the dipole. Now the purpose of the feed line is to take whatever power is generated here, transmit it to the antenna where it can be radiated out. Conversely, any signal that's received by the dipole is transmitted back or is conveyed back to the transceiver where it can be heard. There'll always be some loss. Every transmission line will have some loss. I'll come back to the middle in just a minute. Let me talk just for a minute about transmission lines. The oldest, actually older than I am, is what's called open wire feed line. You had two conductors. This came about in the First World War. This was used extensively in the First World War. You have two parallel conductors, usually 14 or 12 gauge wire, separated six inches usually by usually porcelain insulation. Now I've seen PVC pipe cut to length and use. And if you go back far enough, if you couldn't afford porcelain insulators, you took wooden dowels, soaked them in paraffin to keep them waterproof and use those. That is said to be 600 ohm open wire feed line. The characteristic impedance, and you'll hear that word, is 600 ohms. Now we'll come back and tell you what that number means in a few minutes. The second type of transmission line that's common is 
Anybody want to guess what this is? Letter line. Sometimes called window line, sometimes called letter line. You got two conductors, probably an inch or a little over an inch in, in uh, space. They're held apart by molded plastic with little slots cut in. It's 450. The third This came about in the late 1940s with television, sometimes called television twinkling. It's in big, it's in 300 homes. And the last thing I want to talk about, is coax. Now coax is available anywhere from 100 ohms to 25 ohms. It's, uh, if you cut back the sheath, I've seen some coax as small as an eighth of an inch, miniatures of that. I've seen some well over an inch, the conventional coax. If you cut back the sheath on it, and you'll find braid, sometimes some tinfoil material to increase the coverage. And usually Teflon or some type of foam uh, dielectric in the middle and then a wire. Now, for this purpose, I'm going to talk about 50 ohm coax. For the most part, that's just about what all, that, that's a common use in hemp circles. It used to be 75 was used some, but not much anymore. Now, this, these three are the lowest loss. This is the lowest loss. You'll have less loss using this than you would ever have the coax, which is the most loss that you'll find. Now, just a question about the, the impedance. The characteristic impedance we've got here, 600 through 50 ohms. And I want to admit something that I did well over six, close to 70 years ago. I was in a class similar to this that was being taught for a bunch of us kids in high school. <laughs> I was in a class being taught for, to prep us to take an iron exam. And I asked the question, the guy that was teaching was Jim Taylor, one of the sharpest, sharpest guys I knew. And I asked this question, I can't believe I ever asked it, but I did. Where can you take an ohm meter and measure 600 ohms on an open wire feed? And I've thought about that a lot of times. I found out about six years later how you can measure. But Jim's answer was better than anything I could come up with. His answer was, it's not that kind of an ohm. Simply accept it for what it is. You put two wires six inches apart, it's 600 ohms. You get some coax and put stamp 50 on it, accept it. It is what it is. Don't try to understand it. Actually, there are three things that make it what it is. I can show you, but 90% of you will walk out of the room. The, uh, the thing that, make the, that makes the, uh, the number what it is, the size of the conductors, the spacing of the conductors, and the dielectric. Those are the three things that, it, that uh, determine the characteristic of beads for transmission. A transmission line can be made to do just about anything. You can make one look like a capacitor, an inductor, a short, open. You can do marvelous things with it. And that's one of the things I'm going to show you in just a few minutes. Now, Gene, show me the slide on the, the if you would, on the uh, coax different types of coax. No, the one I want is the comparison of the uh, losses. Oh, I mean comparison of losses. Okay, that's where I was. There we go. All right. They told me I'd have a, a corner here, but uh, as you can see, they lied to me. 
I brought a I brought a garden stake. I'll use my garden stake. Whoops. Uh, what we're showing here is all coax is not the same. When you decide what you're going to use, pick the right one. RG58, now what we're showing here is different types of coax and frequency here. And we're showing the loss for each type at the frequency level. RG58, which is about the size of this pencil, is great for connecting the transceiver, transmitter to an amplifier, something of that nature. Gene, what's it good for? 300 watts or something? Uh, well, something like that. Close right here. Uh, you would not want... RG58 is good for 400 watts. All right. At, at 30 megahertz. Yeah. Okay, go back now. Yeah. Now, you wouldn't want to use that as a feed line to the antenna. It's lost. Look at, uh, let's say this is the middle of the HF band. 1.4 dB loss for 100 feet. 100 feet. Look at your 213 or RG8. About half that loss. So you wouldn't want to use 58 for use for your uh, transmission line to the antenna. It'd be great for connections inside the shack. Okay. The other thing uh, I wanted to mention, I've looked, I haven't seen the poor schlub in here, but I once knew of a guy that ran the, the transmission line from his 70 centimeter Yaki, that's 400 megahertz. He ran 100 feet down to the shack of RG58. <laughs> his comment was, nobody ever heard me, and I never heard him. And I wasn't one bit surprised because he was losing every bit of power he had in the transmission. He had a one-to-one -one match, beautiful match, but he had a dummy loader. If you don't have, we don't have it on the chart, I don't think. If you want to use anything at UHF, use LMR 400. It has much less loss. Okay, kill that one. All right. Now, what I want to show is this. The minimum loss in that transmission line is going to be when the impedance of the transmitter, transceiver, whatever, is the same as the feed line, is the same as the antenna. Now, don't think it has to be 50. I'm going to give you that as an example. It could be any one of these if they were matched. You've got a transceiver with an output impedance of 50 ohms, and you use 50 ohm coax. If the antenna is 50 ohm coax, then you have what's called a matched antenna. You have a one to one SWR. And you'll have the least amount of loss. But, suppose you're using 50 ohm coax, the antenna or the transceiver is 50, and you got 80 ohms up here. Now, you've got an 80 ohm antenna, 50 ohm transmission line. Anybody want to guess what that transceiver has to see? Anybody want to guess? Nobody? Well, the answer is I have a damn this idea because it's a, it's a trick question. There's no way you can know. You've got to know the length of that line. And the length of the line, that we, we're going to show you an example, but remember, the length of that line, if you vary it, you vary the SWR, you vary the, the impedance that the transceiver sees. I'm going to show you that one. I'll tell you what, let's do this. Let's show that slide next. There's a slide from EasyNet. That's an antenna modeling program. We use the one with the dipole gene. All right, here we go. And what we've got, this is a, a display from an antenna modeling program. 
it's a great tool if you if you haven't how many of you have seen using that before? A few of you have. It's an antenna modeling program. You can crank in any type of antenna you want, put a transmission line in, and it'll tell you everything you want to know about it. You can vary the transmission line and look and see what you have to match, see the gain, feed point, pattern, everything. So what we're showing here. There's a 40 meter up or where's the transmission line so. All right, now what, what length have you got? Because I can't see it from here. Uh, point one foot. All right, what we're showing is the antenna in peaks because we've got the transmission line shortened up to one inch. What does it read, Jim? What you want in peaks? Yeah, in peaks. It's 77.7. All right, it's close enough to what we've got. We've got a 50 ohm piece of coax feed and a 77 ohm antenna. Now the question is, Suppose you stretch that feed line out, stretch it out to 100 feet and see what we get. You'll have to read it because it's a Okay, the impedance is 41 ohms. All right, so you see what's happened is the antenna is 77, the feed line is 50, and the transceiver has to match 41. Now, watch this very carefully. You don't have to remember the numbers, but you have to remember what happens. Add 10 feet to it. Yeah, and Charlie and I were talking like if you were going to move your rig across the room and you needed 10 more foot of coax added yeah. to it. So what you do is add 10 more feet of coax. Now what do you see the impedance is? 26 ohms. So what's happened is 10 feet of coax has changed what was 77, the antenna and was 40 or so with 100 feet, you had 10 feet and it's now 26. You vary that, co that coax line and you can see anything in there. And some of the transitions are dramatic. All right, let me go over. Suppose you do this. What's the next thing you want to do? If you can't, if this thing won't match it, that's 110 feet. And you get 100 and what was it, 26 ohms? It won't match it. So what do you do? Nine out of ten. Put in a tuner. Now the purpose of the tuner is to take whatever is here. And in this case, we said it was 110 feet, so it would be uh, 26 ohms. What's some of that? The 50 ohms here. And when you do that, you see an SWR here of one to one, you're happy. The transceiver's happy, happy as a clam. What you don't see, this is now not match. You got loss here, and you got loss here. So whatever you're generating here will not get up there because of the loss. And we're gonna we we Borrowed, stole, whatever, appropriated a slide from uh, from QST, the gene QST. This is a good one. I think I can read this one. We got a 40 meter dipole fed with ladder line, 100 feet of ladder line. You got a tuner, and you got a 1500 watt amplifier. Now it's a 40 meter dipole, and you're going to feed it with, with uh, 75 meters, 3.8 meter a second. The mismatch up there, instead of being what it would be at 40 meters, it's now, what is that, 10.3? Yeah, 10.3. 10.3 minus with a reactance of 800 and some ohms. By the time it gets down to here, it's 2,285 minus almost 6,000 ohms. And the tuner has to match this to 50 ohms. And look at the loss. You got 1,500 watts coming out here. You're losing 144 watts in the tuner. You are losing 1,189 watts there. You're transmitting 
200 and what? 267. 267 what? It is not the answer to a maiden's prayer. That's what you can get with a mismatched antenna. Any questions about that? Is it a revolution? Is it, is it a, uh, a revealing thing to some of you? I've heard some say that the tuna was the greatest thing he can work all bands with any kind of an antenna with a tuna. Well, you probably can if you're willing to put out a fraction of your power. Okay. So the best scenario is 50 ohms of the antenna or whatever you have and the same amount of impedance at the other end of the base. The best possible match is, I, I, I don't want to say 50, but whatever is at the source or whatever is the antenna, the feed line, and the shaft. Can't always get that. And that's what I'm going to go into next and explain what you can do about it when they're not matched. And to do that, let's go to the vertical. We got here coax in the shaft to a matching device and then to the vertical radiator and the radio system. One of the drawbacks of the vertical, it's a little more costly than this. I mean, how cheap can you get? Two chunks of wire, three insulators, and two ropes. And that's the old cheaper. What do you got to have here? You must, if you want it to work, you must have a reasonable radio system. And we'll run through that. Don't think, and I've heard this more than once, I've got a well case that goes down 600 feet. It's great for lightning protection, but it won't buy you a dime before making that thing work. So you've got to have, you've got to invest in a radio system. Now I found that you can make your point easier with numbers than you can just say something goes up or down. That's why we showed that uh, the piece slide with the you know with the length of the transmission line. So let's take and make 7200 KC. That's what we'll put into the to the vertical. And we're going to make it the simplest possible vertical you can get, which you hear all the time, quarter wave length vertical. And on 40 meters, that would be 32 and one half feet, and we will make it two inch cheap. That's what we're that'll, that's what we'll start off with, and you'll see what happens when you change some of these things. If you do that, you don't really need a matching network. Like so. Well, that comes out. This is going to be very close to 50 ohms, and you can uh, you'll have you'll have no mismatch in the coax. I'm going to show you how you can have none or very little. But that's the starting point. Waterway vertical, 7200. Now, I'll come back to the matching network later. Let me give you just one or two thoughts on the vertical. The example we made was two inches, but it doesn't have to be. It can be, I've once known our club loaded up a water tower one time. And I'm not on 75 meters. And it worked. Mm -hmm. We literally shunt fed a standpipe of water. It can be that thick, it can be Rome Tower, it can be Chivin, or it can be wire. If you want to make an old cheap, if you want, if you really want to hide your antenna, make this at a 28 gauge wire. If you're not running a lot of power, it'll work. It'll work better than you think. And I'll show you how that works. So it doesn't have to be Cuban. And it really doesn't have to be verb. What you see is what you normally see in any bird. It can tilt like this, and you'll see very, very little difference in performance. We're going to show you that in a few minutes. And the third thing to remember, and I hear this all the time, 
I'd love to put up a vertical of 75, but I can't because there's no way in the world I can get something up 75 or 66 feet. There is a myth out there, and I don't know how it got started, that unless it's an order labeling, it won't work. And it's simply not true. And I'm going to show you at least a half a dozen ways that will show you it really doesn't need to be a quarter way. Okay. So if you know that it can lean, doesn't have to be a quarter wavelength, and doesn't have to uh, be tubing, you could do this. Get yourself a tree, and incidentally, this is what Doyle has done with this. So we'll rope over a tree, put an insulator on the end, put wire down to an insulator, pull it home with a ground stake of some kind, an anchor of some sort, put a radial system around it. And most radial systems will have a bus. It can either be a plate or a heavy gauge wire around that you tie the radial system to. You put a radial system. That's a cheap one. The coax comes up, and if it's a quarter wave, they tie that to the vertical, this to the radial system, and you're in business. I want to show you, once again, you can look and can see what takes place when you change those things. Gene, go to the, the vertical. You got that up. We've got to start off with two inch tubing. And we got it straight up. And Gene, you can read it to blur to me. What's the feed, feed point 35 or so ohms? 35 ohms, yeah. Okay, 35 ohms. And go to the pattern. Let them see the pattern of the sucker. A beautiful donut shape. This is what the radio, this is what the vertical looks like. And as you see. The signal comes out that way. It's on the direction all the way around. Now, look at the gain. This shows the gain. And as you can see, it's up at about, what, 25 degrees? 5, 10, 15, 25, 25 degrees. degrees. And that's the, the gain there. Okay, go back to the antenna. Change the tubing to 14 gauge wire. Trader model free. The, it has limited use. You can what we're doing here. You can easily model. Any of you are interested, I'll be glad to sit down and go through with you how to do this. If when I bought the uh, one that I bought years ago, I spent three days downstairs playing with this. Thing. You can't imagine what this thing is like. But anything you can dream up. It will compute for you everything you want to know about. Hold on, hold on. Just give me a fault. Where have I got to put the number 14 in at? In it, the wire. Which is what thickness? Wire thickness, yeah. It's not letting me put a pound sign. Oh, uh, what have we got here? Oh, oh, oh. Take the hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I messed up because we, we've got this set up to do two things and I forgot. Hold on just a minute. You have to put number 14 in. Yeah, and i got to put it in this column. Don't change the other Yeah, I'm not. Well, that's okay, now. You're going to love when, what we come to in a few minutes. Okay, I've just changed it to 14. All right, and what do we see then? 33 side? ohms. Goes down to ohm. Not enough to make any difference. Not enough to get in a twist about. So it, it shows, it presents the same impedance. Go to the pattern. Same thing. Go game. to the game. It's the same. Same thing. Now, watch what happens if we tilt that sucker over, say, five feet. Okay. Here we 
Here I come. Yeah. Next one up. Oh. Yeah. Let's see this. Put a minus sign on it. Okay, see it, children? We're now tilting it over about five feet. Now go through and look at the same thing. The patterns change somewhat, but not enough to get into. You you'd never hear the difference. Yeah, and you see the gain's only a half a dB down here. And the impedance is roughly the same. So it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be tubing. It doesn't have to be totally vertical. It can be slanted. It can be wired. One of the nice features here is you don't need guy wires. You can't get a cheaper version than this. Okay, anybody have any questions about the, this portion of it? I'm just going through general and then we'll come back to the specifics. Any questions about that? Minimum 16 radius. Do what? Minimum 16 radius. I'm going to get to that. I'll show you. You can pretty well judge for yourself. I'm going to the radius system, and I'll say the number and length, but down just a little bit further. A couple of things to remember about the radius system. It doesn't have to be on the ground. If I had my vertical, what's this, about four feet? I could put the vertical four feet and have the radios coming out and not even touching the ground work fine. Doesn't have to. They can be elevated or they can be laying on the ground. Now this is something a lot of the guys do. You saw our radio here, pull it tall. You staple it down to the ground. The ground staples, you get them at Home Depot. Even if you can get them at uh, Lowe's. Or if you want a cheapo, get yourself some old wire coat hangers. Cut them six inch length, spin them in a bend them in a, in a hairpin shape, and just stick it down. Pull it tall, stick it down. That'll hold it on the ground. If um, that's that is an acceptable way, and after a while the grass will just grow around. But if one does come loose and you're mowing, it can ruin your whole day. So what you want, the best way to do it is exactly what the, the uh, broadcast station do, is bury it. Now if you're going to bury it, and that's the preferable, that's the way I do mine, don't bury it deep. Deeper is not better. Don't go more than an inch to an inch and a half deep. You will destroy the purpose of the radio. An inch to an inch and a half is off. Two things. Let's say you got a tree here. You just loop around it and keep on trucking. If you've got a house here or a sidewalk, come up to it and bend it to the side. Anybody have any questions about that part? The what? Uh, for, uh, for elevated radios? Yeah. Any height. It's not broken. If you want to use elevated radios, you can tune those radios. If you do, three to four is enough. You basically have a ground. Most of the time, if you want to use it on multiple bands, you'll have to put in a pretty good radio system. And that's what I'm going to show you. If you want to use that on all bands, and incidentally, the top DXer in Australia, low band, the 160 meter. I had worked him several times. He always had a strong signal. Always. Call was VK6HD. And he died about a year ago. Had a big write up on him on the top band of the player. I didn't know until they had that write up on him what his antenna was. I, I looked at every card I'd get. He simply wrote vertical. I do not have any card from a DX or with any consequence on 160. It isn't using a vertical. Verticals rule on 160. The length of his vertical, what he 
He was the closest to WZ on 160 of anybody. The length of his vertebrae was 35 feet high. And he was the top man. You're going to see why you can attain that kind of results with a short vertebrae in just a few moments. I'll show you how. <laughs> you what? The man talking to me. The wind has popped up. Maybe it didn't do it. Any other questions about that? One last comment about the radio perception. This is a ground that's not like the normal ground that you see for your house. You look at a power box and what do you see about a six or an eight gauge wire going to a ground rod? You don't have to have any wire here. Charlie, yes, let's get to a, a, a stopping point for a five or ten minute break for bathroom breaks and whatnot. Okay. Well, I tell you what, well, let me make one comment. It's a good place to break. Then I'll show you how it works. Now's a good time. Oh, okay. Anybody want to take a restroom break or whatever? Now, does the gauge of the wire make any difference as far as your perception? No, not as far as your ground radius. I've, uh, I've got all kinds of stuff in so the ground. 10, 12, 14? Oh, yeah. Okay. Would you leave the insulation on the radius? Yes, yeah. I'll leave it on. It, you're looking for a ground plane there and not an actual connection to ground. That's why they work in elevated form so well. And, you know, if, if you elevate them, you get all of the effects of the ground out of the picture, and that's why it takes less rain. Okay, if it's elevated, does it make a difference to leave the insulation on the wire? No. no difference at no. all. And all my wire, the antenna, the loop, and everything is insulated number 12 wire. Did you uh, sign the sheet? No, I don't have it. Yet. Okay. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> If we do an SWR sweep with this thing, 
You'll see that we've got below a two to one across the whole band. So you don't need a tuner with it. I don't use any tuner. Well, that's what I'm trying to stay away from. Yeah, I don't use one. Yeah. All my stuff's matched, and uh, when we get like on Charlie's 160 antenna, all you can get is about 50 kcs out of that with a real low SWR, below a 1.5 to 1. If I'm running 1,500 watts, it'll put over 100 watts back into the house at 1.5 to 1. The alpha amp will shut down, see a fall. So I have built a remote. Uh, you can put a pull at the bottom of it, and you can switch taps on the pull to move across the band. So I have a system that's, uh, as I move across the band, I switch taps. I never go over 1.2 to 1 anywhere in the band. That's, that's what you're looking for. Yeah. And so, that's what makes it work so good on like, you are late. You know, you got it. You can't have any loss. Well, you were talking about just letting work and your bird delta. Does it make any difference? It's not. It's not no, so it's a very, very little difference in the pattern. When you, like, if you're on 40 meters, uh, well, on all the bands, the height of it makes a difference in the way the pattern is. The closer they are to the ground, the more omnidirectional they are, and the more cloud warmer they are. But it makes no difference if you're on the top of it, or you've got the point in the ground right there. I've got some models over here. I might sneak as well. I don't want to get in front of the point. But it's much easier to throw one rope over the tree, pull it up, and then just pull two ropes out. Yeah, pull two sides out. And like I said, Jerry had come up with that idea. I mean, this was a rope from computer to here. We started pulling this up. They ended up a lot of us
What the coax is is this. Two resistors in series. Can't get to simple. This resistor represents the vertical radiator. This represents the radio system. And I'll show you what makes up each one. This is the simplest of all to come up with. You can look it up in a book. The value of this resistor depends on how high this is. We've made it a quarter wavelength. At a quarter wavelength, this resistor's value is 35 ohms. Is that something? If it's shorter than a quarter wavelength, the number goes from 35 down to zero. In other words, if it's an inch and a half, it's close to zero, inch and a half. And something else happens. A capacitor creeps in. If it's longer than a quarter wavelength, this number goes up and it reaches a peak at a half wavelength. Carry this thing up to 65 feet, and this resistor will be close to 100, uh, close to 1,000 ohms, depending on the type wire cubing or whatever you have. And at that point, any time you go over a quarter wavelength, an inductor creeps in, and that can foul up your match. That's why a lot of people say quarter wavelength is the only value that will work. That is the beauty in a quarter wavelength vertical. You don't have to put up with a capacitor inductor. That's the only value where you see there's nothing else there. That's why it's commonly used. You can look up whatever value you need based on the height in handbooks. You can't do that with a radio system. The radio system, I can tell you what you're likely to measure, and that's the only way you can tell what it is, is measure. I can give you order of magnitude, and I can give you some general rules of thumb. And I'm going to start off with the gold standard, and that's what you see at broadcast stations. Most AM broadcast stations, and don't frequently hear this number, they will have 120 radios, and they'll go out one quarter of a wavelength. If you put in a radio system, like a broadcast station use, you'd want to put in 120 of them, and you want to take it out about 33 feet. Now, you don't get any advantage in going over four-tenths of a wavelength. Four-tenths of a wavelength is a max that will do you any good. If you put in 120 radios on a vertical, it won't be because you need it, it'll be because you like very copper. So there's no need going that high. If you were to do it though, this value will be between one and three ohms. If you did that. What I found, and I have measured <coughs> dozens of vertical types of them, this part of the country, you put in about 24 radios. And you put them quarter wavelength long, this is going to be about five ohms. Put in about 24 radios, and it'll be roughly five ohms. So the coax sees 35 plus 5 or 40 ohms, it's a close match. It'll be about 1.2 to 1. And you can you can tolerate that. There'll be some mismatch on the line, but it's it's acceptable. Suppose, and we'll kill two birds with one stone here. <clears throat> Suppose you want to put this thing on 40, on uh, 75 meters. 3,800. What happens then? You saw what happened when you tried to put 3,800 on the dial. You ended up radiating about 15 to 18% of your power. You can set it up where you have no loss in the coax, and I'm going to show you how to do it. If you were to do that, we got here 3,800. You'll see that this, if you look it up, 
there's going to be somewhere around 10 ohms. And you'll have a large capacitor here. And this will be about 5. Now what you'll find is, if you look into it, you see that large capacitor. This is going to be sky high. You won't be able to measure You won't be able to get anything to get into it. The most efficient way to handle that is this. You don't want to look at the, uh, you don't want to look at what this thing is at the shack. Get an analyzer right in the matchbox, like so. Tune it to 3800KC. Put an inductor in here. With a little click lead. And since this is low power, if it weren't for this capacitor, you'd see 50 ohms looking at about 15 or about a little over 3 to 1. What you do is slide the inductor, in other words, play with it, so you can see that SWR go down to a minimum, and it'll be about 3 to 1, somewhere at all. When that happens, the reactance of this inductor cancels out this. And the only thing you have then is 10 in series with 5 ohms. You still got 3 to 1. The way you can solve that, there's two problems, and two ways you can solve it. Commercial practice is to use a nail network. You can look up in the handbooks the values you need. I've done it before. I don't do it anymore. I do it a different way now. A nail network and an inductor and capacitor, you can get any match you want. You can make 50 ohms equal 15. And if that happens, you've got one to one. Uh, you, the, uh, the thing is, is 50 ohms there. Hook the coax up to it and you have another one loss here. That's one way you can do it. You have no loss going out to the, to the uh, uh, antenna, and you are radiating roughly three, four, what is it, 66% of your power. And about five watts, is five, uh, 60, about 33% is lost in ground. You don't get it all, but you get a lot of it. I'll show you how I can make it better than that. That's the simple way that you can put it on another band. Now there is a better way than this. The way I used to do it until Jerry Civic found out or, or uh, perfected the un -un. And I've got it in my pocket. How many of you are familiar with the transmission line transformer? Anybody familiar with it? This is the greatest thing since sex, and I'm serious. It's a ferrite core. I'm going to try to get as close as I can so you can see it. I know I'm walking on. It's a ferrite core. It has four windings on it. Each one has four turns. This one matches 50 to 12 and a half ohms. And you can wind these that will match 50 ohms to 5.58, 12 and a half, uh, 18, 22, 28, 35, 75, and 112.2.5. Uh, Should be eight of them in there. One, two, three, four. Yeah, I think that's close enough. You can wind those suckers that will match. 50 ohms, any of those. It's unbalanced, unbalanced. Now it's hard to believe, but this thing is flat. It has no frequency sensitivity from 1 megahertz to 40 megahertz. Use it on any HF band. It matches 50 to 12.5. It can handle 3kW, and you'll lose less than a half a percent. It is truly uh, this is the way to go. Now, if you're interested in these, go to Amadon. It's a website. It's a company out in California. And purchase this handbook. Transmission line tra uh, transformers handbook. 
It's not, in the strictest sense of the word, a transformer. You'd have to see it. There are four windings and they're hooked up in an unusual way, put it that way. But it is a, it's a very, very useful tool. You can match anything with this. I'll show you what uh, a good example, then I'm going to move on. Let's say you don't want to match. You don't want to use this 40 meter in town 40. You want to use it on 30. So you put 10.120. Anybody in here working 30 meters? It is a super DX man. My favorite. What you do there, at 30 meters, since this is longer than quarter wave length, this is going to be 100, roughly. What you're going to have here will be an inductor. You put a capacitor here. Tune the capacitor. It, minimum SWR is going to be about 2 to 1. Put your little transformer in here. It's a three terminal device. And it's a one-to-one -one match, close. And you're going to transmit roughly 96, 97 percent of the power at a low angle. It's a great device. Okay, let's see. I want to show a couple of things. Yeah, the, the thing you want to remember with a bird, you want to get the resistance down as low as you practically can without spending a lot of money burying copper. You want to get this one reasonably high. I'll show you a couple of ways you can do it. Now, theoretically, you're you're showing what the equivalent of that 32 foot antenna looks like in capacitors and inductors, right? Yes, I'm showing what this 32 so foot looks like. Oh, antenna, but you're yeah. changing what's in the box. I'm changing the the uh, frequency I'm putting in. I'm showing how to match that 32 right. foot vertex on those bands. I've put it on 160 before. There are a couple ways you can make this resistor high, which is what you want. One way. If you get a wire going up, say, 60 feet, on 160, that's going to have a vertical that's going to be in the deepness of around, oh, I don't know, 6 ohms, something like that. You can put what's called top loading on it, a series of cross uh, wires. That'll make it appear longer, and this can go up to around 10 ohms. Or, you can do this. You can put another 70 feet out like this. That's what's called a Marconi, or an inverted L. It's still basically a vertical. Yeah. How can you leave the 32 foot exactly like it is and change different bands inside the box? Simply plug them in. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not joking. It's that simple. Okay. If you want to change bands, I'll give you an example. I have a 75 meter vertical that I use on both 75 meters and 30 meters. It's five weights on 30. I use a different matching network on both. And it, it's actually, it's in there, and I use a relay that switches back and forth. You can do it either way. Most all the verticals I've got are set up to plug and play. I can put, punch different type of values in and play with them that way. Any other questions about it? Okay, this is a way to get that resistor here higher. There is another way. This is your vertical, your radio system. We'll come back to this one because this is a favorite also. You go up to the top, come over, and the spacing here is not important. Remember that. Bring it down, tie it to the radio system. It's what's called a folded monopole. When you do that, you multiply the feed point of beams by a factor of four. It's a way to step up a little bit to a high. Gene showed a picture of an antenna that looked like this in the beginning. And that's what it is. It's a folded monopole. It's a way to raise that number up. Is that what you're doing with 
shouldn't be a tower? I'm sorry? Is that what's happening when you shouldn't be a tower? Uh, shouldn't be a tower is a little bit different. But what he's talking about, is anybody familiar with shunt feeding a tower? If you have a tower and you, you don't have the base of it insulated, there's a way you can make it work. There's a couple of ways you can do it. Shunt feeding is one of them. That won't increase, that will not change the height of it though. It's just, it's just a way to match the V to the tower. Now I want to show you four examples that will make my point, I think, that I want to make with this. The first is, um, I talked to a bunch of guys, they're just like me, they're sitting around waiting to meet God, and, which is a good way of it. And we talk every morning, half a year. And a few years ago, there was a signal that came in on top of us, and he would identify, I was a beacon, identify with four, I think it was three letters on a number, whatever, we didn't know what it was. One thing I saw it was a fish food. And what we found out, a little research, we found out here's what it was. It was an S9 signal from Wisconsin through the Midwest, Missouri, Arkansas, down to the tip of Florida, Miami. I could hear him he use S9. <clears throat> it was a buoy. It was anchored, marking the channel, it was anchored to the fourth ocean in Nova Scotia. It had a five foot whip on the top. It was operating on 160 meters, 1865, with five watts. And you ask, how is that possible? Here's the way. You go back to the same thing, the classic uh, vertical. This is going to be about a tenth of an ohm. Because it's a short. And you have a lot of capacitance that you can tune out. Look at the ground resistance. It's floating in salt water. So it was practically negligible. Perfect, perfect a perfect, close to a perfect ground. Very close. Here's another one that I think will make a, make a pretty good point. You're going to show your power ground loss and the ground resistance and all. Uh, let me go through this and I'll see if we have to get an I'm not much of a stick man, but a few years ago, Jerry Civic, the guy that, that uh, made the transmission line transformer, developed it, did a lot of work with short verticals. And he had a picture in one of them in QS, uh, CQ that he put in that had a six foot vertical on 40 meters. Behind his house, he had this regular vertical, which was 32 and one half feet, and had the radios and all that. His wife was in a lawn chair under what looked like a beach umbrella. And he was making comparisons between his 33 foot vertical and the 6 foot vertical. And he found in 90 some percent of the time there's no difference whatsoever. And you wonder how that's possible. And here's how he did it. What you could see at the base of this thing was literally, well, it's well over 100. Radio was going out four tenths of a wavelength. So he was able to make the ground loss about one ohm. Put a lot of effort in. What he had here, you couldn't see it beneath what looked like a beach on bone was top loaded vertical. He made that about five ohms. You cancel this out, and you've got something that's as effective as six as a big one was at 32 and a half. He found no difference in two. His wife was simply for scaling, so you could look at it and see what it looked like, size wise. <laughs> now I want to show you my favorite.
there's a couple of things to there's a couple of as our fearless leader says teachable moments here years ago there was a company some of you may remember named Gotham you better remember that an antenna company they sold beams and they had a farce that they advertised a vertical for 40 meters and what you got for this vertical was a hole and an alligator clip two pieces of aluminum that would get you to 20 feet and two cable clamps that they suggested that you put on a fence post and put it in the ground and hold the vertical up and I had a friend that bought one of those things and he swore by it thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. He said he worked all over the world with that. Here's what he had. The coax went here and the shield went down to a ground. And he kept talking about, uh, you know, he couldn't understand why there was a need for ground run for radio system because his was working just fine. He also said that he had a perfect one-to-one -one match. He measured it with a, with a, uh, analyzer, perfect 50 ohms. And I told him, I said, well, I think you could do even better if you put some radios on that sucker. So I asked him about three months later, did you try the radios? He said, I had to take them loose because my SWR started going down. Now here's what you, you, you must know what that SWR is telling you. Look at what was happening. If you can look at this thing and measure 50 ohms looking into it, he had a, this thing is a uh, capacitor because it's short. This is going to be about 10 ohms. 20 foot at 40 meters is about 10 ohms. We know this is 10. We use the inductor here. To cancel out this, you got a perfect match. What has this number got to be? If looking into it's 50, this is 10, this is canceled out, that's got to be 40. So what that guy's doing is pumping 100 watts into this thing. 20 watts is being radiated and 80 watts is warming the worms. He has, he has about 20% efficiency on this thing. Look what happens when he starts adding radios. He told me he would add one, and then the SWR would start to go up, and he'd add a second, and the SWR went up. Look what's happening. As you add radio, this 40 goes down to 35, to 30. As you add radios, he got it down to where it was 15. When the loss was 15, his SWR was 2 to 1 because the combination was 25 with 50 ohms looking into it. So at that point in time, he said, I can't stand this SWR. It's getting too high. But he was already getting almost half his power. He had he cut his ground loss in half. Couldn't make him understand it. Now, Gene, I want to show the antenna that we're using. This is something I came up with about six or seven years ago. It is a method that you can use on anybody. I developed an antenna, and it was published in QST. I called it because that's what it looked like, an inverted delta loop. What it looks like is a delta symbol with a point at the ground. It's an inverted delta loop. Now, you think to yourself, that's a loop. It's not. It's a bird. It looks like a loop. I call it a loop. And the reason I call it a loop is a loop sounds better than a squash folded monocle. I can't think of a worse name. But what you do, the way this thing works, ponder this. 
let's say you get an antenna of 60 feet. On 160 meters, this is going to be about you know, 600 or so. Not much more. If you take it at the top, and you remember I mentioned, you fold it. If this thing were a quarter wavelength pattern, ordinarily unfolded to be 35 ohms, you'd be 135 feet high, which I couldn't get anything up that high. And it would be 135 feet high, and the feed point would be 35 ohms. If you fold it, Bring this down and attach it to ground. This 35 goes by a factor of four, will be increased by a factor of four, and it becomes 140. Now, if you take, and I hope I can do this, if you take it like this, push it down from the top, water wavelength down from the top, it'll flare out. In other words, as you start pushing down, what you get is this. You see what's happening? You see what's happening? Push it down. The length around it stays the same. You get it down to 60 feet, and the feed point in that thing is roughly 75 long. It's a good way to take an antenna that, uh, that you can't get the height you want, but you can take it and fold it, if you will, let those flare out, and it will fit, it will uh, be a higher intensity when you start with. This is one that Gene and I have used with great success over the last few, few years. Any questions about that? What happened to ground radius? Do what? Ground radius, what happened? They stay the same. What you do, the only thing you're doing is flaring out the folded vertical. It looks like a loop. It functions like a vertical. The pattern is omnidirectional. It doesn't favor any side. There's no broadside. Here's the pattern of it. And if you look, it actually has 2.95 dB a gain. Show. So, but that's uh, completely omnidirectional. Didn't change the look angle. Didn't change much of anything, except the people. It's a way to have an efficient antenna and a low frequency. All right, I want to do one more. <laughs> I think you'll love this one. Gene, I want to show the vertical. The vertical. Now you remember we put up a vertical, the, the initial one, was a 30 foot or 32 foot vertical with two inch cubic. And there it is. And look at the pattern of that sucker. Now is it wire or is it back to, have you got it back to two uh, inches? Two inches, yeah. All right. So this is the pattern of that sucker. And that's the gain. And you see it has no gain. Yeah, unity. Same as uh, uh, an anisotropic source. Now what we're going to do, let's assume you're happy with that sucker. Oh, you got it tilted. No, it's, it's straight now. Oh, okay. That's the curve. All right. Suppose you're happy with that vertical. And you want to put up a, a tower. Uh, you know, away from it a while, put something else on, maybe a beam. And show that, Gene. Can you show another one there? Okay. Uh, you want me to make it? Make it 35 feet. What we'll do is 30 sections, and we'll put a beam on top of it for top loading. It'd be basically an effect of 35 feet. Now look at the pattern. Oh. Uh, hang on. Now he didn't touch the vertical. Look at that. He turned it into a beam. 
What's happening is that other beam, that other tower is acting as a reflector. It's picked up some gain in one direction, but yeah, got, it's a beam. But you've got loss in the other direction. So you we could make it, Gene, make it the other way. Now, what if you got this from 30, what, 35? Yeah. Make it, uh, say, 29 or 28. It's acting now as a director. Now, if you really want to have some fun with these things, you divide the power and feed two different ones in phase. You can make these things do all sorts of things. Anybody got any question about the vertical? You can put a vertical on any band. And you can hide it. Okay, want to go to the dipole and we'll try to get through this one quickly. Okay. All right. One, one question, Charlie. Yeah. On the, uh, the guy with the 20 foot antenna, if he had changed that coil to a capacitor, would that not? No. No, because the, the 20 foot antenna, it was shorter than a quarter away from it. Oh, okay. So this is going to be so a he'd have had to He would have no. He would have. He would have actually gone the wrong way. He would have made it worse than it was. They knew when they sold that thing it was short, and it would have to have a roof for it. All right. Let's talk the uh, dipole. Now, what I'm going to do here, a dipole can be fed anywhere along here. And it can be any weight, but you get all sort of complication. For simplicity, I'm going to show only one. Center fed, half weight. We'll make it 66 feet because that's a half weight weight. That's the magical number for a dipole, 66 feet. For a 40 meter dipole. If you want to put it on 20, then it would be 33 feet. What I want to show you is this. Unlike this, which always has the same pattern, it's a low angle, it's omnidirectional. This sucker is a, uh, depending on two things, the impedance can change, the pattern can change, and the gain can change. Now the impedance of an antenna like this, looking into it, looks like this. This is height. And this is radiation resistance. In theory, if it were perfect ground, you would start from here from zero, but it's not perfect, so it's going to look like this. As you go up in height, and we're going to show you that in a second, the resistance will go up to about 90 ohms. As you keep going up in height, it'll come back to maybe 50 ohms. It'll go up to 80, maybe to 60, and it'll settle, settle in free space at 73 miles. And it'll have a pattern at that time. Now what I want to show you is what happens with a simple half-wave dipole, depending on two things. Only two things will affect The height above ground and the type of soil you got. There are a couple of guys in our group that are in the Midwest, you put up an antenna like they have here, it wouldn't work anywhere near as well. They have high conductivity soil. We've got its. We've probably got as poor as anywhere in the country. Gene, what we want to do is show that easy net and show the pattern and the feed point of feeds for a halfway dipole on 40. And what we'll do is start with this thing and what happens as you start raising it up. And you can tell pretty much what you're going to get from a dipole, depending on if you want to get on there and blast there, way is there a way to do it? If you want to work DX on 40 meters, you're going to have to get this thing way up in the air. Probably more than any of them have got the ability to. You'll see that just a moment. Let's start. Okay. What have we got? 
Okay. We got it now at uh, 34 feet. Let's start at 10 feet, Jim. Okay. Now you got your dipole, it's 66 feet long. It's at 10 feet. What's the feet point of difference? Can you read it? It's a blur. Well, you want it at 10 feet. Yeah. Should be around 50 pounds, I think. Okay. 10 feet. We've got 46.5 yeah. pounds. It's close to a perfect match if you feed it with coax. So you got your 40 meter dipole and it's up high enough where you can touch it off the ground. Now, look at the pattern of that sucker. Straight up. It has no plus or it has no, no pattern whatsoever so far as orientation. It wouldn't make any difference which way you, you, you did, northwest, east, south, whatever. At 10 feet, look at the, uh, look at the shape straight up. What's the game, Gene? 2.7. All right, now watch that 2.7. Now increase it up to 30 feet and watch what happens. Now look at the feet point. Oh, okay. 68 ohms. All right, you see that the impedance is going up. It's now going to be somewhat mismatched. But look at the pad. It's still straight up. Look at the gain. Now we got 6 dB of gain. If you want to blast the airways, put up a dipole about 30 feet. It's omnidirectional. Or, you know, now this is for 40 meters, understand that. Put it up about that height, and the pattern goes straight up. It's about the same as a three or four element beam, about a three element beam. Goes up, bounces back down. Any question about that? Good, yeah. a good East Coast with antenna. Yeah, it's good fun. It would be fine if you want to work nets on the eastern half of the United States, up through New England, down through Florida out to the Midwest. It's great for that. You would hear a DX station. What would happen if you put your matching network on there? Wouldn't make any difference. Nothing. Not a bit. The only thing that's going to happen with a matching network, you mean at the antenna? Well, you see? Yeah, at the antenna. You wouldn't have as much loss in feed line. That's the only thing that take place. If you could take, how much was that? If, uh, what was the thing for? It was, uh, 68.5. Yeah, well, you probably, there's a place where it'll get up even higher than that. Then you might want to use a two to one balance up there. But your SWR right there with the, uh, let's see, we've got it should a be too high. No, it's, uh, it's not. It's almost below up two to one across the whole band. Yeah. It'd be, and with that kind of gain, you could tolerate some loss. You're not going to lose much. Yeah, we're sure. It's short. fairly close. Okay, go up to about uh, 60 feet now and watch what happens. Okay. We want to go look at you. We now got 67 on still. All right. That time, I tell you what, go back to, what have we got, six, 60 feet? Yeah. Go back to 50 feet. We've got 75 on. See, it's ricocheting as you go up. And look at the uh, look at the pattern again. You see now you're starting to get a pattern. You're getting away from all the path of the energy going straight up, and you're starting to get a, a broad side to it. And we actually got six dB again yeah. down at now, the other angle. Gene, go to the asthma where we're looking down on the pattern and go to about uh, 40 degrees. Yeah. Do you see what you've got here? And if you go look at the sides of it, you'll see that you're down to just no gain on the sides now. So it is a, a bi-directional antenna. Go up now to say 80 feet. Now here you're going to see something take place. Now we got 
about 54 ohms. Okay, so you, once again, you've got a thing where it's very closely matched. Look at the pattern. It looks like it's on burr. You get some strength up, but the majority of your strength is broadside to the antenna. See, now we got 8 dB again there, too. And what's happening is, therein, if you've got an antenna that's, let's say, east and west, and you want to work, work Europe, you're not going to. Because all your strength is going, all your power is going north and south. Do you follow what I'm saying? It's a mixed bag. Here, the direct, the orientation you've got that dipole makes a difference. Pretty sombrero. Gene go up to about 150 feet. Now what happens is a dipole will start to show that classical broadside pattern in what's called free space. Well, it, free space is several wavelengths up. It'll start to show it in that. It'll start to show it at about a half a wavelength. You've still got the 8 dB gain here, yeah. but you've got a 7 dB gain chunk up there, too. Take angle. Yeah, look at this. Yeah, real low takeoff. Real low takeoff angle. Then you can work the X. If you can get it up, what do we say? 150. 150. If you can get it up to 150 feet, it'll work for you. That's why a dipole is very difficult on, on 40 and up. You've got to get it high for it to do any good. So I mean, for, for, to get the angle down. If you follow what I'm saying? It's great for local. It ain't worth a damn to be at. I know we're jumping ahead. I don't know how much time is this. Go ahead. We're I hit, think we're, we're running. We hit probably. nine o'clock. But do yeah. You so why don't you go ahead and cover loops? What well, do you want to show a loop here real quick? We uh, can. I've got you one here that we can show. If you've got a sky loop. Yeah. All right. I'll show that. And and then. You remember what what the. Uh, yeah. Here's a forty meter sky loop at forty at uh, thirty four feet. All okay. right. Or thirty feet. All right. What you got? What you got? It's straight up. All right. Now, take and uh, and look at the game. Oh. Six dB, straight up. At, at what? How many feet? Thirty feet. Thirty feet. So it's it gives you more game than a dipole would at that at, at that, that height. Yeah, you had to go up to one hundred. Go up a little bit higher. Go up to say fifty feet. It's coming down. It's coming down. Gene, let's try one thing. <laughs> I want to show you this with the pure laughter involved in it. All right, change the frequency. Let's say you want to use that sucker on 10 meters. This is not a dramatic uh, 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 appearance as though as the 160 meter. But you can get all types. Look at the angles. It's a tremendous DX uh, antenna. Look at the angle that that thing takes off. Look, we got almost 11 dB of gain down there. So the guy on the other end, now here's what you find. The guy on the other end of that thing would really think you'd run a six element beam. Yeah. Somebody 50 or uh, somebody a couple of hundred miles away wouldn't hear you because they're little loads. So that's why a loop is really a pretty good antenna to have up for all bands. Yep. Because when you start going above the design frequency for it, you start picking up gain on it. Well, look at the feed point, Gene. 59 ohms. Close enough. Is there some reactants in there? 14. That's a reasonable enough. It's pretty good for that. One of the guy, one of the guys that we, we have in our group has a 160 meter sky loop, it's 80 feet above the ground. The gain he gets is phenomenal. And the uh, uh, old DX, his looks like a porcupine. It, 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 it. Gene, I want to show one more thing. Go back to the dipole if you can. Yep. And put it at 30 feet. 
It is. All right. No, it's at 40, actually. All right. And it breaks down. Look we'll at the pattern for a second. All right. Okay. Make it 30 feet. Make it 30 feet because I, I have something I want to show you. All right, there's your pattern. Okay, look at the gain now. Okay, what is it? 6.35. All right, now what I want you to do, Gene, is go back to the setup and change the ground here from, <coughs> let's see, you have to. I got it on high accuracy. Yeah, and what you need to do is to. Uh, Put it on the internet. You no, know, high accuracy is what you want. But we need to see here, so where's the column that shows us the value? Right there. All right, now click on that so you can change it. Okay. And change it to, uh, so you can click, do a, do a right click on it. Okay. And as you see, what we've got here is our type soil. Average, pastoral, heavy clay. Go out to the Midwest where you've got, this is fresh water, go out to very good. This is in the Midwest. Same antenna, you take it and put it up in uh, Nebraska or Kansas. What's the gain on that sucker? 7 dB. So you're going to have, you get it down lower, it's more pronounced. It is, you can get sometimes as much as 3 dB difference between our ground and their ground. Twice as much power. Okay, Gene, you want to cover any of the loops you developed for field day? Now, basically, I've got the sheets y'all had to show the dimensions on there for them. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> it, it's kind of funny. The, uh, the, the one thing I had uh, done was, uh, let me see if I've got that on here. Yeah. Well, th this was the 40 meter loop, but I had two of them. I had, had them 90 degrees of each other. And if you look at them and you look at the pattern, and this explains pretty much, you, you, see, you see some gain, if you want to look at it that way, from left to right, but not as much top to bottom. The actual gain of this thing out to the sides here is 3 dB. Well, 3 dB is almost neg negligible to the ear, but it's like doubling your power. So I had hoped by putting two of them 90 degrees of each other, you know, we'd get better coverage and get more signal out there and be able to work more. Henry said he could, after working all weekend with it, he could tell very little difference switching from one direction to the other. I thought maybe it wasn't working. I took it home and checked, tore it all apart, and everything looked fine in there. We didn't lose any connections. It was working, but the 3 dB was just hard to tell. I think on a few signals you could tell it. Yeah, there were a few. You could yeah, tell. but uh, yeah. most of them he couldn't tell. But I, I figured that I figured that the three dB gain, you know, actually helped us make more contacts, but we we really couldn't detect it listening to it. Made a lot of difference on ten. A lot of difference. Directional difference. Yeah. Okay. So, at any rate, those loops are somewhat directional, but not enough to worry about. And the pattern you see is pretty much like you saw from a dive hole up much higher. Uh, the top of this thing was a probably 40 foot, the bottom of it 10 foot off the ground. But beautiful, no SWR across the band, and uh, they just work. And, and they're really simple to pull up. Probably it's really more simpler to put that up than it is a vertical and have to pull the ground radio. So if you've got one band you want to work, uh, you can take that sheet I gave you. Now the links on that sheet for all those antennas are probably just a little bit long and you would have to trim them down, but that's better than cutting the wire too short and having to add some to it. So it's a good starting point. But uh, all of the loops that we had over there, most of them we fed with uh, 75 ohm coax. And that's one thing you can do uh, to match the a quarter wave piece of coax, of 75 ohm coax on those loops will give you a perfect 50 ohm match. Or you can take a four to one ballon and put on there and do the same thing. Uh, the 75 ohm coax we were using at field day was some old TV uh, 75 ohm coax with a little bitty single conductor. 
you can run, I've run 500 watts all weekend on something like that too. Then. So, you know, I wouldn't want to go up to 1,000, you might belt it, but 500 it'll handle it. But it's, uh, it's pretty simple to match it. So, and their patterns do, much like a dipole, as you raise it up, it comes more pronounced to the ends uh, on the loops and you get more directivity out of it then. But, uh, and that's why I modeled all those loops at a set height. And my original plan, and I didn't get to stick to it in field day, was to hang a wire down from the bottom of our, or a rope down from the bottom and just only pull them up that high so that I maintained the pattern that I wanted out of them. But we didn't quite stick with that. Some of them were pulled up three or four times higher than I planned them, so at the smaller loops. But, they all still seem to work well. Anyway, I guess that's about it for tonight. Charlie, you want to take any questions or anything? Yeah. Any, anybody have any questions? Okay, well, we appreciate everybody coming and a nice welcome. We're going to get away with the prize for the.